So very much we're, we're, we're treating it as something that might open up um, whole other domains in subatomic physics. And, and like you said, we really have to study every aspect of it. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson, particle physicist here again. I hope you've had a brilliant week and have a fantastic weekend in store. Now, this week, sadly, saw the tragic news of the passing of legendary theoretical physicist, Professor Peter Higgs. Today, we will be discussing and celebrating his life, work, and legacy. Peter's most celebrated work came in the 1960s, the development, with other physicists, of the Higgs mechanism. The mechanism that gives fundamental particles, like electrons, their mass. The mechanism proposes that there's an invisible field known as the Higgs field, which exists everywhere in the universe. When particles pass through this field and interact with it, they acquire mass. Kind of like a cannonball feeling a drag when passing through a fluid. Peter's brilliant insight was to point out that if enough energy is pumped into that underlying field with a machine like a particle collider, that field should ripple and pop out a new particle, a smoking gun revealing the Higgs field's existence, the infamous Higgs boson. Peter Higgs gave physicists a way to prove the validity of the Higgs mechanism. They had to discover that smoking gun. 50 years later, they did just that at the Large Hadron Collider in 2012 and reduced Peter to tears. However, the discovery of the Higgs boson is not just an amazing historical footnote, Studying the Higgs boson will allow us to probe nature in new ways at both current and future particle physics experiments and for centuries to come. Peter's work has provided a new window on our universe, one we are only just beginning to peek through. To help me understand more about who Peter Higgs was, how his groundbreaking hypotheses came about and how the name Higgs will guide particle physicists for centuries to come, I'm joined by a phenomenal special guest, Professor Victoria Martin. Professor Martin is a particle physicist at Edinburgh University, Peter Higgs's old stomping ground. Her research focuses on understanding the intricacies of Peter's eponymous boson and its relationship to the other fundamental particles that make up our universe. She is a member of the Atlas Experiment Collaboration at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the world's largest collider, and has a keen interest in developing potential future colliders, such as Click and the Future Circular Collider, to unravel more mysteries of the Higgs. So I couldn't hope for a better special guest to help me understand the late but legendary Professor Peter Higgs, his phenomenally impactful work and his enduring legacy. So, Victoria, before we jump into kind of the intricacies of the science and the intricacies of Peter Higgs's life, you knew the man. How would you describe the Professor Peter Higgs that you knew? Right, so I always describe him as an Edinburgh gentleman, yeah. which is, a, I think, a rather specific Edinburgh phrase. <laughs> well, obviously it is, but a kind of a specific Edinburgh kind of person because Edinburgh is quite a sublime city, mm, very I guess, to, to live in. And the Peter I knew... Well, I initially knew him as a teacher, so as, as a lecturer, but the Peter I knew latterly after he retired was someone that really took advantage of the things that Edinburgh had to mm. offer. So he would go to the Edinburgh Festival, he would go out to eat, he would, you know, go and have a dram of whiskey, <laughs> he would he would go out for beer, he would go and look at the art with many, many good and free art galleries in, mm. in Edinburgh. Um, and in fact, I, you know, I don't want to name drop here, but the, the place that you are most likely to see him was Waitrose. So I know quite a lot of people that bumped him into in Waitrose. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he, he really enjoyed living in Edinburgh. So it wasn't, it wasn't just, just it wasn't just a place there to go to work. He really loved the city and engaged with the city. Yes. And, um, I'm, I'm told, so I don't know this. For sure, but I'm told that he chose to move to Edinburgh. He had, uh, there was different jobs opening at the time when he was he was looking for an academic position after after his PhD, mm. and um, 
somehow with a few other people, they managed to arrange it so they all got to move to which city they wanted to. And Peter had wanted to come to Edinburgh, I think, at that point to be close to the to the mountains. So... So it sounds like he really loved those those Scottish things. A dram of whiskey, walking in the Highlands. These are very uh, stereotypical Scottish things. I think you can do them in many places, but but Edinburgh's definitely a good place to do them. Mm. Super. So Peter Higgs, obviously a, a legendary name in the field of particle physics. What Can you tell us anything about Peter's early life? I did a little bit of um, research on this. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this is especially for those who feel that, that particle physics might be something that they can't get into or something that's impossibly hard for them. I, I gather that his his early life had quite a lot of upheaval. It wasn't it wasn't the easiest. Uh, yeah, I mean, so so I don't know, you know, I've never really spoken to him uh, about that, but I, I do know a bit. So he was born in, in Newcastle yeah. upon time, and I think his father was working as an engineer for the BBC. Yeah. And they ended up, he ended up in Bristol yeah. after that. Uh, so I think a lot, a lot of moving around and upheaval and a lot of missing school. He, he actually had to oh. do a lot of uh, home education. Um, okay, no, I didn't actually know this. Oh, okay. I don't know this. Um, <laughs> so uh, everything yeah. didn't come to him very, very easily. Also, um, the World War was obviously on during his childhood. And yeah, of course. Suffered from... Um, quite serious childhood asthma so not the easiest of upbringings so so we we see nowadays this this um this titan of particle physics this brilliant man but really quite a quite a difficult upbringing when you uh when you look into it but what i do know is that when he went to school he attended the same school that Dirac yes. Paul Dirac had attended in, in Bristol yeah and he did say that that was a you know, there was a plaque on the wall and it was something that caught his interest um, when he was attending the school. So I, I guess there was a spark of like physics there already. Yeah. And, um, of course, Dirac, uh, actually, you know, one of my favorite. Uh, Pioneers equations, of. To be honest. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's well, the, the Dirac equation. I, yeah. I love the Dirac equation and all the intricacies it has. Yeah. Um, so definitely one of, yeah, I'd like to think if I had a plaque to pull the rack, I would have been interested <laughs> in that as well. So, so yeah, that's that's exactly right. So he ended up in, in Bristol, um, you know, moving around with his uh, with his father's work for the BBC as an engineer and ended up at um, Cotton Grammar School here in Bristol from 1941 to 46. As you say, this was the same school that was attended by uh, Paul Dirac who was, uh, you know, Dirac Spinners involved in um, basically the the foundations of the Feynman calculus and and predicting antimatter as well. Um, very, very accomplished theoretical physicist. Um, from then, he ended up at the uh, City of London School, where he specialised in mathematics. So the rather lovely City of London School here. Ooh, that does look like a nice building to yeah, go to. Yeah, it's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful building. And then on to the um, King's College in London, where he graduated with a first class honours degree in physics in 1950 and achieved a master's degree in 1952. And he did a PhD, finished in 1954, on uh, entitled Some Problems in the Theory of Molecular Vibrations. Um, so not a particularly easy upbringing, studied hard, had a lot of homeschooling and a lot of difficulties to overcome. But then knew what he wanted to do, went into mathematics and physics, initially based down in London. Um, he then was appointed to a senior research as a senior research fellow at the University of Edinburgh before various posts at Imperial College London and University College London. So he seemed to flip back between Edinburgh and London before he eventually returned to Edinburgh in 1960 to take up the post of lecturer at the Tate Institute of Mathematical Physics. So he seemed to flit around between uh, London and Edinburgh before, as you mentioned, finally setting down in Edinburgh and uh, and uh, weighing anchor there. I think it's interesting that his actually his PhD and um, some of his work at that point wasn't in particle physics. Yes. In fact, he was looking at um, what we call condensed matter physics. Mm. So the physics of like many atoms at, at once and and how 
well, molecular vibrations, but you know how the atoms move around in that, and it's and how that linked into particle yes. physics. I think that's yeah. I think that's very interesting and something we don't often see these days that people can easily move between subdisciplines in physics. And that might give us some forewarning or or some uh, some signposting of how he came up with the idea um, that that he is so famous for, which we're we're going to come on to now. So. Um, Peter ended up, when he returned to Edinburgh, addressing the issue of how fund fundamental particles acquire their mass. So how did he end up asking this question or getting involved in this area? What what were the problems that needed to be overcome when Peter addressed this in the, in the early 1960s? What was the problem with mass? Well, I mean... So the, the issue was trying to understand how some of the basic theories that were understood at the time kind of fitted together. So people understood about uh, relativity. Yeah. I mean, Einstein's theory of relativity and that um, things going fast um, have to obey that. And they understood about quantum mechanics. So in fact, the, the Dirac um, theory that we already talked about, that there is... Well, that there's matter and there's antimatter, but they also have this fundamental quantity called spin. So the kind of quantum mechanics of particles and putting them together <laughs> to come up with what we call quantum field theory. So this was kind of as in its infinite in in. <laughs> I can't say that yeah, very word. Well. It's all right, you get it out. Early, infancy. early stages, early yeah, stages early of stages, putting yeah. these things together. I mean, the, the the two theories were were kind of understood separately, but putting them together. Yeah. And um, nowadays, something that we rely on a lot in particle physics, but at that time was kind of not really in vogue right at the start, as you said. Yes, in fact, it's right. Yes. So there was there was lots of people were looking at different ways um, to, to describe these particles. And, and this one that we use, um, quantum field theory, was was one of the options, but mm. wasn't indeed the most popular one mm. because it couldn't explain some things. And, and one of the things it couldn't explain is why um the particles have mass why they have weight yeah um and particularly at that point they were thinking about uh the force like you've illustrated there that keeps protons and neutrons together inside an atom inside the nucleus of an atom yeah so this is the thing we call the strong uh force at the moment and there wasn't a way to ex to well and a nice way to really explain <laughs> how uh, that worked. I mean, so the protons and the neutrons stay really close together inside the nucleus of an atom. They're not all flying about. Otherwise, we wouldn't wouldn't have atoms. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a sh what we call a short range force because it only is really experienced over this really tiny. We're not tiny we're not all blobs distance. down into a massive super nucleus, so it must only be over a short range. Thankfully for for us. And there was no way to really explain this in terms of the, the 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 putting together the quantum physics and the relativistic physics, unless what was kind of helping to exchange the yeah. forces, which is what you need in, in this relativistic quantum field theory. You need a way to explain how the force is being exchanged, it's like another particle to do that and it would have to be a massive particle to keep this as a short range force and there really wasn't a way to do that yeah. and that's what peter was um that's what his theory was really trying to address to find a way theoretically <laughs> that you could give a mass so instead of having the massless the things exchanging the force they could really have a mass yeah so this so this short range the short range force the 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 framework that they had was telling us that the, the particles that are exchanged to, to create this force should be massless. But the fact that it's so short range indicates that it probably has a mass. And we can think about things like pions being exchanged in the strong nuclear force nowadays. But at the time, it was like, how, how do we get this mass in there? Everything is telling us that these exchange particles should be massless. But the nature of it tells us that it they must have mass. They, they're constrained in distance. They must have a mass. And trying to marry those two together, as you say, was was proving very problematic. Yeah. 
That's right. And actually, Peter used some ideas that he knew a bit better from his his previous work, yes. really, in condensed matter physics. So um, looking at superconductivity, where they had managed to solve a kind of adjacent problem in an superconductivity. So in superconductivity, you still have something moving around, um, not, I guess, not carrying really a force um, anymore, but carrying like electric charge. Mm. But so something that's moving through the medium and and carrying information between one thing and another thing, one area and another area. So it, it was related to that. And he managed to see the connections mm. um, between them. And in fact, it, there is a story there that one of his jobs at the Tate Institute of Mathematical Physics, where he was based, was to open up the new box of journal publications that came every week. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, nowadays we, as scientists, I mean, I can get an email every morning. It just goes on the archive and it's... Yeah, it's just, the they just yeah. appear in my inbox. And, and <laughs> if I have time, I, I browse through them and sometimes... I have to say, I just delete the email without reading them properly. But there, you really had to open up a box and put them on the library shelf. And so, so someone was responsible for opening up the box um, and putting them on the shelf and just browsing them to see if there's anything useful. And it was it was Peter's job to do that. Wow. And so he got kind of first sight of all the papers, wow. um, which was apparently a really... Uh, fortunate position and i guess a very privileged <laughs> position to be in that you could see them before anyone else you're so, kind of you're kind of watching the the cutting edge of the field coming to you first yeah, of I mean, all it's, yeah. it's like twitter coming in a box yeah like every yeah, week yeah. something like that so um yeah and i uh, and and that so he saw those papers come in that that kind of inspired his thinking and he managed to put things together so i don't think it's it's too um wild to say that you know it was an idea when peter came up with it in 1964 whose time had come yes i mean it but he managed to do it as one of the first people there is uh, always the discussion about the order in which we're, we're, uh, gonna, we're gonna get onto that a little bit don't we're gonna we? get yeah, onto yeah. that yeah, yeah. okay but uh yeah but yeah that that opening up the box and seeing the new publications every week was really, really useful for him. So in terms of in terms of the idea that he came up with, so so I always explain it with a particular analogy, which I know you're not especially yeah. fond of. Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll I'll start and then you you correct me. So the basic idea and it was, uh, as you say, it was um, inspired by his work in condensed matter and, and work of. Uh, symmetry breaking in in superconductivity and and condensed matter physics, but essentially suggesting that there that space was filled with a kind of invisible field of energy that kind of acts like a treacle. I know you don't like it. I see when your face starts to starts to go, <laughs> and that when particles pass through this um, this treacle this field, they interact with it and they kind of feel a drag, if you will, and this this drag kind of appears to us as mass. This was kind of his idea. How would you, how would you, what analogy would you use or how would you explain Yeah, I, do, I mean, it's the treacle I find, I yeah, find the the bit, um, this day. So I do really like treacle, so it, it's not treacle <laughs> per se. Um, but I, and I do like to talk about a field. I mean, that's what the way that physicists think about it. So we're all really familiar, even if, if it's a new concept to us, we're all really familiar of what, it's like in a field because here on earth we all live in a gravitational yeah. field yeah. so everything you know we're stuck to the floor um everything falls down and that's because the earth is here and it causes or it is the source for this gravitational mm -hmm. field in which we all exist and do all of our everyday life um and the thing about this what we now call the higgs field which is what peter was predicting is it doesn't have a source. Yeah. It doesn't have a thing that creates the field. It just, the Higgs field just is. It just is. You remove everything, well, everything else. You take away the gravity, you take away the mass, you take every. It's there as a kind of base. Yes. Base like, like the air in the room. Anywhere you go, exactly. there's air in the room. Exactly. Yeah. So, it, I mean, 
I think the thing I don't like about the treacle is you can take the treacle away. <laughs> but you can't take the Higgs field away. It, it basically permeates treacle. all of space and yeah. time, the whole yeah. of the universe. And it's just there. And that's so fascinating. How can something just be kind of there in the background? Um, yeah. But that, that's that's the way it works. Yeah, a, sor a field with no source. <laughs> it's a very uh, it's a very radical, radical notion. And yeah, so when particles interact with this, this field in the background, they appear, well, they do acquire their mass. And this, this was, this was Peter's idea. So started off thinking about the the strong force and how to solve this problem of uh how to give these uh exchange particles mass and actually had no application in the end to this strong nuclear force but became very very important in giving exchange particles their mass so how was peter's work initially um thought of by the wider physics community um you said this was a hypothesis whose kind of time had come. There were other people working on this at the same time. But I believe the initial papers that he wrote, um, at least uh, an expanded version of them, were initially rejected and, and kind of the papers went kind of unheralded for quite a while. Is that is that fair? Well, yeah, I, th I think the... So this is where my, my memory and, and detail gets a bit hazy. But indeed, one of the papers was... I, I don't think it was rejected, but it came back from the referee and said, you know, this is all very fine, <laughs> but have you thought about this enhancement? And that was the, the second 1964 paper. Mm. And that the enhancement is to say, oh, and by the way, yes. that if this is true, there would be a scalar particle yeah. associated with it. So yeah. that's the thing we call the, the Higgs boson um, as well. But so they were published but they weren't seen as maybe particularly relevant at the time. Like it's yeah. it, 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 mathematically, theoretically. Um, it works the, and it's nice and yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. The concept works yeah. that there's nothing wrong with it, but it didn't seem to have any application to reality. And yeah. I mean, that's a fun thing in theoretical physics. You can come up with an idea and you can show that yeah. it's, it's mathematically consistent and that would have certain predictions. But if experiment doesn't see that, you know, it's just, it's just a nice idea. So it, I mean, it wasn't, re there wasn't any proof that it didn't work. It just yeah. didn't seem to have any relevance. And um, um, that's what it was. Though, on the other hand, Peter did go and keep working on this for a bit. So he visited a university, um, I think it's North Carolina. I really should remember this, um, Chapel Hill. So he did actually develop the theory a bit more about the Higgs boson, mm. which is this excitement excitement of the field that he came up with. And there's some very nice predictions in that paper, but still it was just seen as a, mm. you know, this is a, a nice idea. And in fact, people thought it's a nice idea, not really relevant, but even if it was relevant, we just cannot test it. There is yeah. no way to yeah. test this theory. And then as a theorist, your theory is kind of, dead and irrelevant <laughs> if it has nothing to say about reality so it you know it it didn't really cause much excitement especially for the first um a couple of years yeah. after it was done it was only a bit later than people really saw the relevance of it so so in 1964 he's writing these these short qf2 qft papers as we said quantum field theory kind of in its nascency not really in vogue, probably not taken as serious as it could have been. Um, the first kind of version of this was sent back and said, you know, you know, kind of sex it up a little bit if you can. And then the amazing thing that that he did, which which actually will feed forward to his name being on these particles or on the on the Higgs boson and, and on the Higgs field, is that he had added this idea that that field in the background that you talked about, that omnipresent field, can be excited and pop out this little Higgs boson, this Higgs boson therefore becomes a smoking gun, an experimental smoking gun to try and show that that field is there in the background. So this was Peter's great uh, contribution. I like um, to point to, and I'm sure you've heard this, um, Peter's kind of words on this at the time where he said, this summer I have discovered something that is totally useless. So uh, 
obviously didn't didn't overhype him overhype the work himself at the time. No, no, and I you know, I think that's when someone realizes that they might have got something that's interesting for them, but yeah. it has potentially no relevance <laughs> further on. I you know, I think that's the sign of a good scientist yeah. because they're not overhyping themselves. They're yeah. like, I did this, you know, let's think about something else now. That's right. And 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 you're you're right to mention though, this was an idea whose whose time has come. There were other groups working on this um at the same time. So there was Anglaire and Brout were working on it at the same time. There's also another group which was Guralnik, Hagen and Tom Kibble. So there were a lot of people working on this idea at the at the time. So there was a small kind of group of people who were taking this very seriously. Um I think John Ellis over at over at CERN wrote a um theoretical paper on how this thing could be potentially discovered at a future particle collider. So there were some people who took this seriously and thought it really was an important thing. But as you said, it didn't really uh, take hold for quite a few years. So when did the the Higgs mechanism and this idea in his work really begin to be taken seriously? I guess this was when we kind of come to electro weak unification in the in the late 1960s when yes yeah. i think that's when it was first kind of invoked <laughs> as a way now to... we can use it to solve another problem and suddenly yes. it's really interesting yeah yes so specifically on your diagram here this this w you have is the w boson and we know that the w boson is short range and again that means it has a mass yeah and it was this you know it was the same uh, We're back to the same problem here. again, like the like the um, like the. So it was um, the same solution. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the first time it, it it was really thought to maybe have more more use. But also, I mean, back then that this idea of this electromagnetic and weak unification, I think, was also kind of fairly speculative. It's again a nice theory that seemed to work, but yeah, it it, it maybe seemed to be more useful than just the the Higgs field and the Higgs boson. But um, yeah, it was it was still something that was, you know, a nice idea. But it did start to bring this idea of quantum field theory kind of back mm. into vogue because it did it did work for this and it did start to solve, I guess this theory of electric unification managed to start solving more problems than it introduced, let's see. So this is, I think, when it became a bit more popular. So that was Steve... Weinberg's um, theory of electroweak. Yeah, so we started to talk about about kind of um, Glashov and then and then uh, Glashov, Salom, and Weinberg. Oh. Right, that's my series we can do. It's me. all right. Don't worry. The um, so yes, yeah, so so in the kind of the late sixties, the early the early seventies, people were trying to put together these these two forces, which seemed uh, originally to be quite disparate. So the the electromagnetic force mediated by the photon, the weak force mediated by the the W and Z. But how could we get these to be part of the same framework? And as you said, this went through the Higgs, through the idea of electroweak unification. And we could come out with the right answers and put these two forces under the kind of same framework, under the same hat. But to do that, you know, we won't get into the grisly details of how you do that. But to do that, you needed to rely on some of Peter's works and some of uh, Peter's ideas. So as you said, we've now got something that seems to solve multiple problems and, and people suddenly sit up and they start to take more notice um, of this work from Peter. So obviously you, you mentioned it's all well and good having all of these theoretical predictions. Fantastic. It solves all these problems. But as we kind of have today with with certain theories, they might work, but can we find the particles and can we find the fields that that underlie them because without that we can't prove that they are um they are true in reality so obviously the the higgs boson the higgs field wasn't discovered for a long time after peter had suggested this did do you know did he ever start to second guess his hypotheses on on whether the higgs field was there in the background or whether the higgs boson would be discovered you obviously had situations like uh LEP, the Large Electron Positron Collider, which didn't find any evidence for this particle. Um, the Tevatron later turned on, didn't find any evidence for it. How how did Peter feel throughout those throughout those years? 
But, um, yeah, so I, I don't actually know how Peter felt about mm. it. Um, because, I mean, I met him when I was an undergraduate student and then he retired just as I mm. um, became a PhD student. And I probably saw him now and then because he would come in. But I think I didn't really speak to him about it until we were really right. on the verge of discovery. But I can tell you how the, the rest of the particle physics please community, do. Are, do. the way that I think the rest of the particle physics community thought about it. So I think, are you showing a picture of the LEP that's accelerator? LEP. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so the LEP accelerator ran at CERN from 1989 to the I year 2000. 2000. Yeah, good. Yeah. good knowledge. Well remember uh, the dates. Because I, I was doing my PhD during, during okay, part of that time. And I mean, so this, the, in fact, this idea of the electroweak unification and mm. the fact there are these um, depending how you count, two or three or four forces, um, was a nice idea, but it was really LEP mm. that showed that math, not mathematically, like precision, yes. the really precision way that that theory could join up all the different mm. measurements that we could see in subatomic physics. And I think it was as it was becoming really clear that this electroweak theory was the right one. Yes. That people thought, ah, so there must be the Higgs boson now. So even though we haven't specifically seen that Higgs boson, we can see its indirect effects of this theory in precision, other precision measurements, which is kind of almost a, a, an indirect look at that. It, it kind of must be there. People started to feel that this this thing must be there. Um, yes. And I, that, I think that's when the confidence mm. came. Actually, there there was an experiment. I know one of the first experiments to kind of directly make not a measurement of the Higgs boson, but directly exclude some of the potential masses yes. was one that um, colleagues here in Edinburgh, I mean, before I was a PhD student, worked on, which was the NA31 experiment. So it was looking um, mainly focused on something else completely. But if the Higgs boson was pretty light, it would have um, decayed into a pair of electrons or a pair of mm. muons. And that experiment that was mainly looking at something else um, managed not to see that pair of electrons, a pair of muons, <laughs> and managed to to rule that out. So that's I, just I, one you, of the... you, I'm sure you'll remember, like me, when I was doing undergrad, these, these massive diagrams with loads of lines going everywhere with Higgs mass on the bottom and then all of these branching ratios that sort of went all over the place depending on what the mass of the Higgs might be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do remember them. And uh, for a long time, we we still wanted to draw them. And yeah. we had to get used to drawing a pie chart because we don't <laughs> need to, like all, all that that um, dependence anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, the good thing was let, let as well at the end in, in, in 2000, they'd managed to say, well, the Higgs boson has to be at mm. least this mass. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd have seen it already. But more of that, and you've you've already alluded to this already, because of all the indirect effects, yeah. they actually had a um, a range yeah. of masses they thought the Higgs boson should be. And if I remember correctly, it was about a hundred and fifteen yeah. giga electron volts. So the giga electron volt is about the mass of one proton. Yeah. So it was between a hundred and fifteen and something like, ooh. I want to say 237, but I'm probably making that up. On your, maybe can, 300. Can you see on the screen now? I think I think they've got um, between like 114 and 185, or or maybe it was 200, depending on the, the measurements that you're using. But yeah, somewhere in that range there between, you know, 115 and a 200. So we narrowed down the range. narrowed the search range be. down yeah. as well. Um, yeah. And then, then I actually went, uh, so after, I never actually worked directly on LEP, but I was at CERN for a long time while it was running and a lot of the people I knew were working there. Yeah. I actually then went to the Tevatron and I went to the Tevatron, um, which is the one illustrated in, in orange there. Yeah. Is it? Yes. Um, uh, to go and find the Higgs boson. Um, so the Tevatron was a <laughs> proton-proton collider. Oh, no, a proton-anti-proton -proton collider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at Fermilab, which is just outside of Chicago in the USA. And um, in the end, it didn't really have enough protons um, to do that. 
they 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 couldn't turn up the proton intensity crank as as much as promised. Um, but yeah, that's I went off to find the Higgs boson, and that really was inspired by Peter, like mm. by knowing Peter, mm. and um. I guess I was having that spark in my mind that that's what I wanted to do because he was such a nice guy. Yeah. And if that existed, we needed to find it for him because, you know, we need nice guys in physics. <laughs> so so by this time, kind of, you know, 2000, we've really, really narrowed down this, this, uh, this mass parameter space of where it could be. Now, you can look at that in two ways. One way you can say, Oh, brilliant! We've done all of these measurements, and now we know exactly where it's going to be. Or you can say, "There's not more. There's not much many places where it can be. So we better we better find the damn thing in the uh, in the uh, in in the data at the LHC." So I've got a nice uh, quote from Peter here, actually. So regarding the kind of original question that I asked about him, maybe worrying that this thing wouldn't be found. So this is from, um, I believe, around 2011. And he said, I had faith in the theory behind the mechanism as other features of it were being verified in great detail at successive colliders. As you've said, it would have been very surprising if the remaining piece of the jigsaw wasn't there. So it seemed like he was seeing it in that first instance where, you know, it is there and we're narrowing down where it can be. So he he remained quite positive. Even uh, but remember that this is stuff. like, what, 2010 or something? Yeah, 2011. This yeah. Is, yeah the, oh, yeah. But this is like, what? four decades after that first prediction so yeah. you know it's i mean it, it seems like a great it is a great quote but it, you know it's taken so long to get there yeah. such a long career he's even retired by this point yes um so I imagine have keeping the faith all the time but that's the you know that's the greatness of of physics uh it works. And it's such an amazing, it's such an amazing, this, this story of, of the discovery of this particle, this is why it's so amazing is because it's such a, an amazing human story as well of someone, you know, waiting and sitting on this for 50 years, just waiting for this particle to be discovered. And, and that's the next kind of question I wanted to come on to. So we come to the discovery of the Higgs boson during the LHC's first run in 2012. What was Peter doing by that time, we're now nearly 50 years after his initial prediction of the Higgs boson. So where is Peter at this time? So uh, Peter is is retired. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think he, he's watching and keeping an eye on the work that the LHC team are doing. Was he still active he's... around the Edinburgh group and, and involved with the work there? Uh, no, no. So he he was a he is was I guess now dear, a theorist. Um, so he you know he would come into the department mm. now and then, um, and have a chat to people. But he wasn't working doing the data analysis, and he wasn't um doing any more theoretical calculations. But he was there as a great. Um, source of inspiration and support, and he was a really good mentor. Yeah. So, you know, you you would often see him mentoring some of the younger students who would go up and um, ask him questions about well about his career and about mm. keeping the faith and yeah. about you know being a a good physicist and and how one did that and not just a physicist but you know also being a physicist at the same time as being a human being. So he was there as an inspiration and a support, but he he was no longer active at mm. in you know doing research at that time. And he was, um, uh, they said he started he to work in uh, a little early eighties at that point. So yeah, yeah, it must have been. They said he was yeah. working on a little bit of supersymmetry in the early two thousand. So that probably you know takes a toll on you. That's difficult stuff. <laughs> yeah. Especially when it's not coming off at various uh, at various places. But he, I, you know, he'd done the Higgs boson. What 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 more was there to do? Yes, there was the supersymmetry. I think that's one of the natural yeah. follow ons. But uh, yeah, I, he had, I, you know he had played his part already. He, he very much had, and and I and I love this. I love this quote from it. I want to get your your kind of reaction and how you think of it because it's a very uh, classic quote that people always come up with, um, and I've seen it a lot this week. So. Peter, uh, continuing to kind of work in the theoretical field after the prediction of the Higgs, 
working a little bit, dabbling a little bit in supersymmetry. When he retired, um, a little bit after he'd retired, he said he wouldn't have been productive enough for today's academic system where academics are expected to continue to just churn out papers again and again and again. What is your reaction to that? He always seems to be incredibly humble and reserved in uh, in what he says to the media and uh, the wider world. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at his publication record, it wasn't as, in, in terms just of the number of publications, it wasn't as prolific as the average academic these days is expected yeah. to be. So we, we as academics are, you know, asked how many outputs, which for physicists is generally papers, we are doing like every seven or eight years and we're all kind of, not ranked against each other, but there's a kind of metricization that now yeah. goes on in academia yeah. to, to see who should be doing it. H indices everywhere and people, you know, showing those around and things like this. Yeah. And and citations are also important. So Peter, I guess at the beginning wasn't because there's the Higgs idea, you know, wasn't very fashionable. Yeah. At that point, he wouldn't have been getting the citations. Yeah. So uh yeah, I think it. I think it's true for you know for that period, um, in the sixties and seventies, um, uh, before before the experiments really started looking for it, it it may just you know someone like that in this position these days may have been suggested that perhaps they're not pulling their weight in terms of research and being asked to do a lot of teaching or yeah. a lot of an yeah. admin and not given the headspace to yeah. to really think um so i think it's a very uh, a very honest quote and i'm very glad that people well there wasn't metricization there but there were some really open minded people that understood that sometimes people really do need the time um to think and they can be productive in a way that is not churning out papers or visiting lots of conferences or giving talks or something like that and he was supervising phd students and a lot of his phd students whom i've met have been very successful um and i always you know personally something i'm uh, always take very gratefully is that i've had great phd students and they've gone into great careers both in physics research and outside of physics research and and uh peter was definitely doing that as well if he wasn't always producing papers at the rate that <laughs> that these days a university would like. Yeah. So we so we come on to finally, after all of this time, the, the particle is discovered. How did Peter respond to this? Because there are certain classic stories that go into the law that, that he kind of disappeared or tried to disappear off to the, uh, you know, and, and kind of avoid and av avoid this thing. So, so obviously the, the, before the, before the giving of the Nobel Prize, obviously the this comes out from CERN. He was invited over to CERN. The uh, I'll see if you you agree with these stories. Have you've heard of these stories that he initially turned down the invitation to come to CERN for the initial announcement of the discovery? Does that track with with kind of what you've heard? Yes, he was actually. So this was July mm. um, or end of June, I guess, twenty twenty twelve. And he was actually attending a workshop or a conference in Italy and mm. um, the invitation came. It would be very nice for Peter <laughs> to come to this special seminar that we're yes. having. What could there. it possibly be about? It would be uh, it would be nice to have you there. Um, so I think at first maybe it wasn't clear that this was going to be it. This yes. was going to be um, the discovery. But also because because he was an older gentleman, I think we've already yes. said he'd been in his eighties at that yeah, point. Of course, yeah. Um, a travel insurance was not like super forthcoming, <laughs> and so because he had to extend his trip outside of the UK, they did call the travel insurance provider and say, you know, can you extend this? And they were like, no, you have to come back to the UK before you can get more travel insurance. And I think that was one of the things that um, initially made him think, no. But I think it became clear after not very long. I mean, I think <laughs> this was going to be you needed really, to be there, yeah. Yeah, I think what he didn't want is the kind of 
endless speculation, but I think when it was clear that this was going to be the announcement, mm. I, you know, I think he was very happy to come, um, as well. And obviously, so, yeah, he got there July. This is the fourth of July, mm. um, twenty twenty twelve. I remember. I remember listening to the uh, watching the announcement in our lab meeting, our weekly lab meeting in in Cambridge with. Uh, the whole LHCB group. Do you remember where, where you were when this was Yes, announced? we were in Edinburgh. So we had got the big screen set up um, to do this. So there oh, had wow. been an update maybe four months earlier um, that we tried to watch on the big screen in Edinburgh. And this, this was before Zoom was uh, really a thing. I mean, it seems we've had Zoom forever, but actually, you know, uh, 12 years ago, Zoom... It was a thing, but it really wasn't thing as reliable as it is now. We had like video, video, video. That was yeah. correct. Video. So we were we were trying to watch this earlier one, and the tech hadn't worked. So yeah. actually, we'd we'd got <laughs> we had practiced this. So we had the big screen, and we got a big room in the physics institute here, and we had uh, not all the VIPs, but a lot of um people in Amazing. watching this um in in Edinburgh um. And uh, so I am a member of the Atlas Collaboration, and so I knew what Atlas were going to say in that seminar. Are you on the Are you on the discovery paper as well? I guess is I am on the discovery oh, paper. Wow, amazing. Or, but ah, uh, yes. But um, you have to remember that on Atlas, uh, we all get on <laughs> almost every paper. Still cool and though. It, it was yeah, and I had been working on a Higgs boson analysis up to then. Uh, just it wasn't the the right final state. Yeah. So it was really depending on the mass, um, which one was the right final state. So of course, yeah. It, it yes, and the Higgs boson does decay to the final state I was looking at, but it, it wasn't one that went into the initial discovery. I can't remember what, what which like ones went into the Atlas initial were discovery. Say, which were, which but, what were the channels for the initial discovery? I was I looking at BB bar. Right. And the discovery channels are Higgs to gamma gamma. Yeah. Um, which is actually very uh, it just happens the Higgs boson is at the sweet spot where it does decay into Higgs to gamma gamma. Yeah. If it was a very much lighter or very much heavier, it just wouldn't do it. Um, but here's this sweet spot and it's beautiful because it's two foot gamma gammas, gamma is yeah. a photon. So it's two photons. Yeah. And um, we can see it very, very clearly. Nice and clean. It doesn't do it very often. BB like, bar, not nice and clean. Definitely not. No, and that's what I was looking at. <laughs> I mean, so the, the Higgs boson does decay to BB bar, but it's a mess. Yeah. And the other discovery channel was to Z bosons. I mean, makes sense, right? Clean leptons, the Z then decays into yeah. like muons yeah. and electrons. Yeah, um, so it makes a beautiful signature. It's actually yeah. even less. So there were the two discovery ones. So I knew they'd seen that on Atlas. What I didn't know was what our friendly competitor experiment, CMS, had seen. Yes, yes. And it was when they saw, where well, they announced... Um, their result there like i knew that's it that's it um that so that that was a very exciting moment and we sent out one of my phd students at the time to go and buy champagne so we could all um drink some champagne so <laughs> and, and this was like started at 8 a.m in the morning Edinburgh yes time. i remember yeah very yeah so early. about i don't know half 11 in the morning, we were we'd had a couple of glasses of wine. You're a little bit tipsy um, by the by yeah, the yes, and and then I remember being on the media for quite a lot of the rest of the day. Still tipsy like, or I recovered? Drunk so much. <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff. So so obviously, you know, we have these very famous pictures of um, of Peter over there. You know, re regardless of his his, his kind of reserve. Very emotional with the discovery of this particle. Yeah, there. he looks very emotional there. Yeah. Brought him to tears, which is which is very understandable. It's the culmination of a of a life's work, and maybe thought potentially he wouldn't he wouldn't get to see its discovery in his lifetime, and he he fortunately um, got to do that. So, uh, in twenty thirteen, as many expected, Peter Higgs was then awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, in physics, along with Francois Anglais. It was also going to go to Robert Brout, but unfortunately he had uh, passed away. Um, another story that I've heard here is that Peter kind of preempted that this might be the case and tried to uh, try to skip town when this uh, announcement was coming out. Can you can you tell us anything about Yeah, about Yeah, so I, I do know a bit of the story. He did want to skip uh, town, um, <laughs> but... 
I, I can't quite remember the detail, but somehow his car wasn't up to it <laughs> at the time. That's um, the story I've been told as well. I tried to get out of but, town, but the car wouldn't wouldn't cooperate. Yeah, so he couldn't quite leave town, so he just he went out for lunch. Mm. Um, to you know, I I said he really likes living in Edinburgh, so he went out to a nice restaurant for lunch, yeah. um, on his own, and did that. So uh, if you look up the university directory back then, uh, Peter Higgs would have had uh, a phone number. Yeah. Um, and it was the phone number of an office that one of my colleagues uses. So, it, you know, Peter's all shared an office with someone mm. for the days that he did come in. So apparently they were calling my colleague in the office, who I think was away as well. Um, so they couldn't get through to him on that on that phone either. Because they do like to phone the people before they make the yeah, of course, the yeah. announcement. So yeah, he he in principle did not know um that what had happened until he was uh stopped in the street by a neighbor, apparently, <laughs> saying congratulations and he you know, he hadn't heard officially um at that point. Though he said, you know, he did good he had a pretty good idea what he was being congratulated for, but this was the first he'd heard. Um, officially amazing stuff so so given the work at the time uh, and the fact that there were multiple physicists kind of contributing to this um, idea of the of the Higgs boson and the Higgs field back in the 60s what why was why was Peter's name on the boson so we, we, we might have we might have highlighted a couple of reasons why but he is as far as I'm aware the only person in history to have had his name on a single particle so we can think about people like fermi with fermions or you know bows with bosons but a single particle i can't think of any other examples apart from peter higgs this is a you know very uh a huge honor to be uh to be singularly named for a particle i don't know if you can think of any others maybe uh people watching can put them down in the uh in the comments mm. if they can think but i can't think of another one no, I mean the J sign might be the closest, <laughs> which which has two names because yeah. um, they couldn't couldn't uh, agree. Yeah. Um, and J is the first letter of one of the discoverers. Yeah. But I think you're right. There is no, I mean, definitely none of the fundamental particles that I think about, you know, ha are named after someone. Yeah. And and the reason is that it's not it's not Dave the, Muon or you know. My electron. There's no none of that. The reason, that, although that Brout and Ungler and um, Kibble, Goronic and Hagen all had the same idea, really around the same time, mm. Peter was the only one that made that mm. extra step to say, "Well, if this theory is correct, you would also get this yeah. scalar boson." Yeah. So this this particle, and I think it was. Um, uh, John Ellis might be one of the first people to actually call it the Higgs boson. I think I've got down here Benj Benjamin Lee, Fermilab oh. physicist. But but I think I think maybe John as well. John probably popularized it then. As I wouldn't the, be surprised I wouldn't as be the surprised. Higgs boson. But Peter himself would not call it no. the Higgs boson. I've got he down here. He called it the A B E G H H K H mechanism. I th well, I think I think he wrote that. He, he would call the particle itself the scalar boson. Right. Because that's what it says in his paper, in fact, okay. that it would be a scalar boson. So scalar is a technical term that means it has no quantum mechanical spin. Yeah. But actually, that's, that's a really unique particle. It's yes. the only fundamental particle we know that has no spin. Mm. It, in fact, has the same quantum number as the vacuum as well. So that really does make it unique in the way that it it behaves and the unique in the role it has mm. in in underpinning how how the universe is working down at this subatomic scale, which is going to come on to its longevity. Longev well, I, I can't speak now. <laughs> kind of come on to its longevity as a probe of the of, of the universe, as we're going to come on to in the. Uh, I've only got a couple more questions, but we will we will come on to that. So, the reason that Peter has his name on this boson really kind of goes back, I guess it's a little surreptitious with that with that paper that was initially rejected. And then he put back, highlighting this idea that that excitation would come out because the beautiful thing about that is that he's given physicists a way 
a scientific and experimental smoking gun to go look for this particle, which then proves that this field is in the background and proves that this mechanism is actually working in real life. So he's he's taken that step between the theoretical and the theory that works to something that we can test for in an experiment. And that's a huge part of why his name is on the boson and why he was so important for, uh, you know, verifying that this this was going on in, in, in nature. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a field is a very hard, you know, is a thing one can experience, but you need to know how something is going to yeah. behave in the field. And then having a boson or having a particle appear yeah. is, is a much, you know, is a much, firstly, it's much easier to see. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, because something actually happens yeah. and it's it's not just a series of measurements. It's like one thing, but it's it's also uh, much, m much more relatable. So something yeah. really kind of smoking gun, yeah. but that's that's the correct theory. When we, we, like... we, we love a new particle. That's, you know. That's, uh, yeah, that's... no, no, that's that's one thing that particle <laughs> physicists love. Although it's kind of weird, isn't it? Because we want our theory to be as simple as possible yeah. with as few particles yeah. as possible. Fair. And then we love a new particle when they come along. <laughs> yeah, then we whinge when we get loads in the 1960s, 70s. We whinge because we can't categorize them properly. So you can't win, you know, loads of new particles, good and then bad because we can't put them all into uh, one box. So we're always we're always whinging about something. So, yeah. Yeah. So I guess as we come to sort of the end of this, I mean, I think it, it's pretty clear. But how did Peter deal with this fame of being a Nobel Prize winning physicist, someone who had predicted one of the key cornerstones of the standard model, someone whose name is now synonymous with a new probe of the fundamental nature of the universe how how did he behave and how did his life change post 2012 2013 what was it what was his life he, like in you know um when i think about it now it it's a bit like einstein remember like we you know they say picture a scientist and a lot of pit, people will picture einstein and he maybe became that kind of person that people would recognize in the street yes and think, oh, you are Peter Higgs. You're this amazing scientist. I remember in Cambridge, people went whenever Stephen Hawking was was around, like you know, people's <laughs> trying to stop him, trying to take a photograph. It must have been uh, a nightmare for him. I do. I did um, actually meet uh, Stephen Hawking once, and yeah. I was also in awe. I was like, wow, I'm so close to him. <laughs> That's actually a very interesting thing to reflect on now. Um, but Peter did not like a huge amount of publicity. Mm. I think he was actually probably a little bit shy. Quite an introverted person. Yeah, didn't want all of that. He did enjoy speaking to younger physicists. Yeah. Um, and he did enjoy encouraging them and giving them some advice. And just having a chat, it didn't need to be about physics, just, you know, again, about life and how to put different aspects of your you know your life outside of work so just uh, just kind of an incredibly friendly person and generous with his time and his advice for for people who yes. are trying to follow through in the field yeah absolutely absolutely so um but he wouldn't like a pylon as we'd call it now and I, i've seen several times like a physical pylon maybe like you um, saw with Stephen Hawking, like people just crowding around yeah, him yeah. and he wasn't very comfortable with that. Yeah. But he, you know, he was very happy to speak to people um, about what he'd achieved and give advice when it was asked for. But more kind of maybe one-on-one -on -one or in small group rather yeah, than- Yeah, one-on-one -on -one and events. in small groups. Yeah, and a lot of people would ask and he was very generous with his time to, time to do that. Um, yeah, to share with them. And like you said, he was still wandering the, the streets of Edinburgh. In 2011, he won the Edinburgh Award for Outstanding Contribution to the City. Um, he turned down a knighthood, but in 2014 was named a Companion of Honour by uh, Queen Elizabeth II. And uh, he says, uh, a nice quote, that he simply learned to say no when uh, people asked him for autographs and pictures. So I think he started off going for that, but um, eventually I think it became a little bit too much, which I imagine is... I imagine there's kind of, again, like, uh, you know, talk about 
um, symmetry breaking, there's probably some sort of level where the cutoff becomes, you know, I quite enjoy doing this every now and again, an autograph and then just being asked all the all the time where you have to kind of start to say no. Good yeah, stuff. yeah. And eventually he he um, shut down his email address as well. <laughs> he did have colleagues that would go because he did get a lot of email, you know, speculative things and, mm. and nice things as well, of course. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, eventually it was just it was too much for everyone to to deal with. So he just deleted his email address and <laughs> there, you know, people could still get in contact with them, but they'd have to go. Um, through s several intermediaries um, to do that as well. And people used to print out his, his email for him. Yeah. And um, because he didn't have a laptop at home and, uh, you know, and then sift through it and say, well, you know, these are triage it, I guess. These, these are the important ones. These are the important ones. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you want to look at these and probably not worth your time reading through all of those emails. But <laughs> even that became just such much for uh everyone to deal with not just peter but the people helping with his email and sorting his email so yeah eventually he stopped that as well like you say he's advancing in years at this stage as well and and you know huge fame you know very very and difficult to, have I to think deal with also all just people. wanting to do the other things that he always enjoyed doing life mm. and just not have yeah always the science yeah taking up so much of his thought space not that he didn't like science no, because he still did, but maybe wanting to look forward with the science and not always reflecting always yeah. back on something that had now come to fruition, and there, you know, there was nothing extra that he had to contribute there because it's it had it's all been done, shown yeah. to be true. Very very cool. So so I've just got two more questions. So so thinking about the future what would what would you say because i want to end on on a kind of positive note because obviously it's very very sad news this week but thinking about the future what do you think what would you say is peter's legacy to science and the modern world what what should people take away from his life and work how should they reflect on him as a person what what lessons should they take away which is which will help them going forward i think that if if that's your passion if you want to do science, if you want to do physics, then you can do it. It's not for any certain kind of person to do. I mean, science, physics is really for everyone. It, you know, whether we want to think about it or not, science impacts so much of our life um, day to day. But it's also really interesting intellectual pursuit. I mean, I think I don't do it because I want to... Uh, <laughs> specifically like make the world a better place i want to do it just because i want to understand yeah. it and if that's what you want to do with your life too you you can do it from whatever background that you come from and so you don't have to be um you, oh well, this is going to be stand weird you don't have to be famous to do it because there's a lot of um scientists doing it that are just getting on with the job and um doing it without being famous, although Peter ended up being famous. And that, you know, sometimes ideas take a long, mm. from your idea, from your correct idea, it might take a long time yeah. before you really find out if it's uh, correct or not. So yeah. science can also be a long-term endeavor. Yeah. And also that you can be a scientist and you can be interested in other things. Yeah. So Peter really did like art and he did like um, music and you could, you know, he like uh, being out in the outdoors. He really enjoyed spending time with his family. I've seen that several occasions. You know, he got a lot of pleasure from being with his family. Yeah. And you can do all of those things and still be a really good scientist and a really good mentor. Mm. Brilliant. Really, really nice message. So I want to finish because, again, on a positive note going forward. So many kind of think of this as the end of the Higgs story but it, it really isn't it really isn't is it because people will think it's the end you know Peter has unfortunately come to the end of his life we've discovered the Higgs which is this this final building block in the standard model but physicists are going to study and they're going to use the Higgs boson to expand our knowledge of the universe going forwards for for centuries are they not 
Oh, absolutely. So I hope it's not the end because like my research at the moment <laughs> is, is still looking at the Higgs boson. Yeah. And we're, we're down looking at um, details of, of how it behaves. But I like to think now as Higgs as a portal yeah. into what, what might come next. And we've kind of um, said some of the reasons for this. Now, it is the only particle that's a scalar with mm. no spin. So and we that, found we found this new probe of the universe, which which ex exi exists and it behaves completely different to any other probe that we have. So we have to study it. It's it's essential. It so the the one thing that I mean we're still testing, but it it, it definitely looks like this is it interacts with the other particles you've got there in proportion to the mass of the other particle. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's different from. From everything else, most mm. things interact with some kind of uh, charge, like electric charge or, or color charge. And the Higgs boson seems to, what we say, couple to this property of mass. And so that is really fundamentally different. Mm. And also because it's scalar, the way it interacts um, is different from the other particles you have on the right there, which are all what we call vector particles with, mm. with spin one. So there could be things that the Higgs boson interacts with that aren't on that table there. Yeah. Things that might solve some of the other issues like dark matter. Mm -hmm. It could be that the Higgs boson is the only particle there that can interact with dark matter if dark mm -hmm. matter is a particle. So it might be a portal into seeing mm -hmm. to, to kind of new interactions or new particles that we don't know about yet that the other ones just can't see. So very much we're 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 treating it as something that might open up um whole other domains in subatomic physics. And and like you said, we really have to study every aspect of it. Um so we, you know, exhaust its potential. Now we've found it and we've spent so much uh, time yeah. and effort doing it. We really owe it to to the public who in the end um Funded that 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 discovery. Funded yeah. that, that we really understand everything that it has to offer and get them, you know, the biggest bang for a buck out of this boson. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's quite alliterative. <laughs> and that's what I find so crazy at the moment about certain certain individuals saying, you know, we shouldn't be building a larger collider. We shouldn't be doing this. Of course, we we need to do those things sensibly and we need to do them cost effectively. But we've discovered this new window on the fundamental nature of our universe. And then to stop now and just say, okay, we're not gonna study that. Uh, seems crazy to me. Seems absolutely crazy. Yeah, I, I do think we we sh we have to keep on going. And of, of course, I mean, we don't do it entirely, or people don't fund it entirely just because it makes you and me happy to understand it. And, <laughs> and people watching this, I guess, happy to understand it. But there, there is impact for wider society when we when we do this research um that everyone gets to know and use and um appreciate even if it's not obvious it came kind of originally from doing fundamental research like this and you mentioned you mentioned their potential portals into potential interactions with dark matter we know at the moment that that kind of 10 to 15 percent of the Higgs decays. We don't know where they go, so there's potential for new physics in those um, those unseen decays. Um, one of the things that people get really um, excited about that the the Higgs field is related to the stability of the uh, of the vacuum in our universe. So we really want to be in the in the kind of next iteration, uh, producing multiple Higgs and seeing how they talk to one another. So bashing Higgs off Higgs. So this is going to keep us busy for uh, many, many decades, maybe, well, almost certainly centuries. So the name Higgs is going to be at the forefront of particle physics for a long time, isn't it? I I, I definitely think so. And I, I think I still kind of fascinated and slightly worried every time I see this yeah, diagram. Yeah, yeah. Like, is our universe <laughs> actually unstable? And might I just cease to exist in a, in a, in a moment? Um, at least it well, would be quick, I, I guess, probably. I, I think it would be quick, don't they? But what I've heard speculate is just like a wave would come through, yeah. there would be, and it would just pass through, and and then you're done. We'd now be in that metastable state, and we'd just be gone. But 
Um, yeah, so we wouldn't know about it. No need to worry, people. Um, and uh, the metastability is... Well, actually, the thing at the moment is we're really unsure exactly where we are between that stable and, and metastable. Yes. Um, it, it's kind of right on teetering on the edge there. Yeah. Um, you can't see it in this diagram, but if you look at some other ways of, of of viewing that, we're right in that that teetering edge between stability and metastability. So I think it's a very interesting universe that that we do get to live in. And and yes, it's by probing this Higgs potential and the Higgs boson and how it behaves that will allow us to to really find out where we are on that graph. Amazing stuff. So as you said, Peter's name. It's going to be at the forefront of particle physics for a long, long time. He's given us a new window on the universe, and it's a window we've only just started to peek through. There's a lot more work we need to do. So, Victoria, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time today. I know you've had a an incredibly busy week. Is there any anything you want to say to close us up, or uh, or are we? Done? I think I've probably exhausted. <laughs> Um, everything I can say on this this week, but it's it's it it's always it's been you know what it's been nice this week. Although I was incredibly kind of shocked and and saddened when I when I found out. In reflection, it's been so nice just to think about you know a, a nice um guy doing physics and a guy that always took the time to to speak to me and speak to other physicists and has i guess inspired my career yeah um to you know to go on and and be a physicist so I, it it's still kind of early days um cuz it was only tuesday that um i heard but uh yeah now i just even these past day i guess I can reflect on on all the achievements, you know, just the impact he had on my life. And I'm very, very grateful for having known him and met him and being able to interact with him over the years. Amazing. I think that's a, a lovely place to leave it. Thank you again, Victoria, so much for taking the time. Like I say, you've had a busy week. I really, really appreciate it. And I think people really enjoy hearing your thoughts about Peter, given the, the, the news this week. So I'll make sure all of your... Um, links and, and work are down in the description and like i say thank you very much for taking the time and uh let's talk again soon yeah you're welcome sam thanks very much take care bye now bye i want to know what you think because you're the scholars of enlightenment that i do this for so please take a moment if you wish to let me know down in the comment section and if you like this video please consider leaving a like subscribing setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.